Don't check out right now. In fact, everyone give a big round of applause for all that are joining online. We still got a huge group that are joining through Face Talk and Insta Twitter uh, and on the Bayside app. My name is Pastor Kurt. I'm one of the pastors around here. How many could use some good news this morning? You could hear a little good news? Uh, between hurricanes and internationally, uh, we need some. And I got a really big good news announcement right at the end of the sermon. So uh, definitely prepare your hearts for that. This is a big, big, big deal. Uh, before we do that, I just want to encourage you, if you're not signed up for the marriage conference yet, you've got to get signed up. It's happening just in a couple weeks here. Uh, we got Levi Lesko. we got Caleb Kaltenbach is going to talk about human sexuality. Um, Mar Mark and Aaron Clark are going to be there. Ray and Carol Johnson, Kelly and I. There's two really big reasons you should do this conference. One is... We're providing child care from, uh, from uh, babies all the way to fifth grade, okay? So what does that mean? That means you can get a sovereign, God-ordained break from your demon-possessed children on a Friday night and a Saturday morning. It's just a couple hours on Friday night, a couple hours on Saturday morning, get all this great content. And the second uh, big reason is that you should join is, is really honestly, now, right now in our world, Strong marriages are such a great witness to the rest of the world. It's not just about making your life better. It's really about changing our world. We gotta quit complaining about the news and complaining about what this happened and that happens. And we gotta make ourselves strong in Christ, especially starting in our marriages, amen? So marriage to 56316, get signed up for that. Uh, and you will not be disappointed you did. Um, go ahead and take out your sermon notes. If you don't have sermon notes, you can always text outline to 56316. They look just like this. We're gonna go really, really quick through a really critical chapter, Daniel chapter six. I'm gonna just jump right in and help you set the scene for Daniel chapter six. What's going on here, if you remember, and I hope you listened to the last two weeks of sermon, there was this spectacular from Ray and Andrew. Um, Daniel is Jewish royalty, and he's actually taken out out of Jewish royalty, he's taken out of a very wealthy, very comfortable, very educated environment and thrown into exile in the Babylonian kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, everyone say Nebuchadnezzar. It's just a fun name to say. Nebuchadnezzar uh, takes Daniel and he tries to convert him into a Babylonian, but Daniel says, culture, you're not the boss of me. And he stands up and remains both faithful to God and effective in his cultural setting setting. Fast forward 15 years, his three buddies are thrown into a fiery furnace and yet faithful to God and effective in the culture. And now we're going to fast forward 60 years. Daniel, taken out of his childhood of royalty, has been faithfully serving God and effective in the culture. And now he's probably in his 80s. And yet Here's the first film, put it right in there. Daniel advances rapidly. What happens? Nebuchadnezzar is conquered by the Mede Persian king, Cyrus. Cyrus comes in, conquers the Babylonians, and then he puts Darius the Mede. I know it's a lot of names. We're going full Game of Thrones here this morning. But you got Nebuchadnezzar who gets conquered by Cyrus, who's the ultimate king of overall Persia, but then he puts another guy over the Babylonian empire that they just conquered, and he's named Darius the Mede. Turn to your neighbor and say, Darius the Mede. Now, Darius the Mede, wants to prove himself to the Persian king, and he wants to keep all of uh, the, the, the spoils of war. And so what he does is he puts a bunch of governors over in charge of everything to keep the spoils of war. These governors are called by a Persian name called satraps, but it just means kind of vice president, government. It means a guy that's really in charge. And over all these governments, or, or governors, I mean, that are in control of the situation, he invites three of those governors to elevate and be over all the governors. You still following me? Guess who gets to be invited one of the top three Daniel himself. So you have these Persian royal family, wealthy men coming in and getting these titles to be over these big areas to preserve the riches of the king. And in the midst of them, he says, I'm going to put a guy over you who's a Jewish exiled slave who used to work for Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel advances rapidly and the satraps get jealous. They plot jealously. They're like, we're not letting this Jewish kid, this guy, this, 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 this 80 year old man, we're not letting him be our boss. He's not a Persian. He's not one of us. So they go to the king and they flatter 
the king in order to entrap him. My friend, beware flattery. If your teenager comes up to you and says, you're looking skinny, dad, he just wants the car. That's what he wants. <laughs> When I was in high school, there was this girl in the grade up for me, my brother's grade, and she came to me and one day, and just out of the blue after a rally, she said, Kurt, I just want to always tell you, I always thought this, you have such wonderful eyes. Your eyes are so kind and nice, and they're really, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know what to do. See, I didn't have a lot of girlfriends in high school. God gave me purity. God protected me by giving me the <laughs> gift of dorkiness. I had the gift of dorkiness. Some of you are not shocked by that. Just kept me so pure. Um, and so she, she, I started hanging out with this girl. She's like, would you help me study for this class? And she's like, you're so smart and you're so good and you're this and that. And boy, I like the way you dress. I like your hair. I like this. I like that. And I was like, this is happening. This girl's going to be my girlfriend. This girl is one of the most popular girls in the class above me. And she's going to be my girl. This is happening. And one night we're studying and she looks at me and she says, can I tell you something? I said, yeah. I'm like, here it comes. And she's like, it's a big secret. I said, you could trust me. I've not told anyone this. It's okay. And I was like, she's going to look at me in the eye and say, would you be my boyfriend? And that's going to be, and she looked me right in the eye and she said, would you introduce me to your older brother? Because I have a crush on him. <laughs> Do not be fooled by flattery, my friends. Because flattery will lead to discouragement. What happens is Daniel is faithful. He advances rapidly. The satraps plot jealously, and the king responds foolishly. They go into the king, and they said, hey, Darius, king of the Medes, yeah, you're the guy. The Persian king has appointed you over all of us. Man, there should be a rule. See, they understood this. This is what was so clever about their Machiavellian plan here. They understood that the king was prideful and that Daniel was prayerful. So they put together this thing where they said, hey, what if you put out a decree? Now, in the Persian culture, when the king made a decree, it could not be changed. That's very important to understand. Could not be changed. Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian culture, he just did whatever he wanted. But there was a little bit more layers to the Persian culture. So if you put out a decree, it could not be changed. They said, why don't you put out a decree for 30 days, no one can pray to anyone except for you, Darius, to meet all the Babylonian captives. They got to pray to you. They're going to get up in the morning. Instead of praying to God over their Cheerios, they're going to be like, oh, Darius, bless this Cheerios to my body. You know, what is this going to be you? And he's like, that's a great idea. I want everyone praying to me for a month. So he signs the decree. And this is what happened. If you're still with me, give me an amen. amen. Daniel 6, 10 through 25. We're going to do 15 churches. Look at your neighbor and say, we're reading the Bible in church. Wow. Here we go. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed. Can't pray to anyone? What's the first thing he does? He goes and prays to God, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and they spoke about his royal decree. Okay, stop right there. Let me explain something. Why is he praying towards Jerusalem? Well, the answer is obvious. In Jerusalem is the temple. In the temple is the Holy of Holies. That's where the manifest presence of God is. But it's even a layer more than that. Solomon, the guy who built this temple, on the inauguration of the temple, Solomon prayed over the temple and he prayed this prophetic prayer. This is what he said. He said, God, if ever throughout the history of your people they're scattered because of their sin and rebellion, let anyone who's been scattered point their face towards Jerusalem and pray and you will protect them. And restore them. He knows this prayer of Solomon. So he goes, this is it. That's that moment Solomon was talking about. I put my face towards Jerusalem. The satraps come to the king. They said, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, um, Daniel, <laughs> by the way, who is one of the exiles from Judah, he pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the degrees you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. You ever have an epiphany that you've really, really messed up? This is what happens here. All of a sudden, the king goes, oh, no. And the satraps go, 
gotcha. Verse 14, when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. In other words, uh, Cyrus, the Persian king, is watching, and if you don't do it the Persian way, you're going to lose face and you're going to lose his trust. Verse 16, so the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den And the king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually, circle that word continually, so important, may the God who you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. Uh, By the way, is there any other place in the Bible where a big stone is rolled in front of a cave? And the king sealed it with his own signet ring with the kings and his nobles so that Daniel's situation may not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. Where he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. May God, my God sent his angels and shut the mouths of the lions. Stop, stop right there, I gotta tell you. So there's always a debate about this passage, whether Daniel was real, this is a fable, and people say, you know, there's no way that the lion's mouth could have been shut. And this is so ridiculous. Of course the lion's mouth could have been shut. Every place that an angel shows up, he says an angel showed up to shut the lions of the mouths. Every place an angel shows up, what's the first thing the angel says? Do not be afraid. Angels are very fearsome. I think Daniel's in that lion's den, and an angel shows up, and all the lions go, meow. I mean, it's, they're like, we'll be over here. We're just going to be right here. You and your old man, buddy, just stand over there, and we'll just have some separation tonight. I honestly think that's what happened. The king was overjoyed, and he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den, and When Daniel was lifted from the den, catch this, no wound was found on him. Circle that phrase. I'm going to come back to that. Because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. Now, did God approve of the wives and children being murdered? No, this is just what Persian kings did. This is what Mede kings did. This was a cruel and violent culture. This is not God approving of that. That's just what happened. Now, also you have to understand The reason the king's doing this is he's removing all of the Machiavellian plotters. These were old men that were these governors. These were their adult children that could have marshaled rebellion against them. So the king just goes, listen, I don't don't believe in the God of mercy and grace. You're all going to get in the lion's den. And the lesson to us is simply this. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. Those that engage in Machiavellian political plots eventually get caught in their own plots. And before they reach the floor, you stay with me, that one person right there. (laughs) And before they reach the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed their bones. Very sad. The king Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of the kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. It just flips the situation. Why study a lion's den? What does this have to do with our situation here right now? I don't know if you guys noticed this, but on top of Afghanistan and on top of the fires and on top of the political unrest and on top of another wave of COVID, there's a giant Katrina-shaped hurricane coming on the eve of Katrina. This is what, this is what surfers call a double hold down. Now, I've never surfed a day in my life. I'm an art major, but I know a few surfers. <laughs> I've played one on television. I don't know. Um, but you know what a double hold down is? You get on a very, very big wave, and the wave just pummels you. How many have ever been pummeled in a wave? And it just holds you down. And the problem is you fight to get back to the surface, and when you're just about to break the surface of the water to breathe, guess what ca- happens? Another wave. You know why it's so discouraging in this season? Is every once in a while you let, you think you're, you let yourself think this thought, it's going to end. It's about to get over. Then Afghanistan happens. It's about to get over. Then a hurricane happens. It's about to get over. You open the door and the whole world is literally on fire. It's a double hold down. Now what does Daniel have to do with this? The secret to understanding Daniel chapter 6 is understanding how old he is. 
If anyone should be discouraged, it's Daniel. If anyone has a right to lose his patience, it's Daniel. If anyone has a right to say, God, where have you been and why am I not released from this situation yet? It's Daniel. Daniel was faithful as a teenager, faithful as a middle-aged person, and now he's faithful in his old age. He's been God-honoring and effective in his setting. When the dreams need to be interpreted, he interpreted them. When he needed to stand firm in his convictions, he did not alter his convictions. Daniel has all the right to be looking at God and saying, where are you and why have you put me through this trial for so long? I came from a royal family. Why am I under my second king of occupation? Daniel has every right to be that guy going, get off my lawn. (laughs) Grumpy old man. And instead, even at the end when he's released, may the king live forever. There's a brightness in him. There's a grace in him. There's an unaltered softness in his heart. How do you handle wave after wave of discouragement and stay like Daniel? Here's the key. Here's why we're studying this. Daniel's a master at handling discouragement. And let me just tell you, you're going to have to learn how to handle discouragement. It's not going away. I mean, how many people are married? Raise your hand. You will be discouraged (laughs) by the person who just raised their hand right next to you. How many people own a human? You're a parent. You will be. How many here have to pay any sort of bill? How many here just went back to school? Discouragement, it's not a sinful condition if you feel discouraged. It's normal. It's a normal logical response to a broken world. How did Daniel do it? How did he do it? How did Daniel outlast liars, loopholes, and lions? Three quick thoughts, and I'm going to move quickly here. One is... Daniel knew who was in control. Daniel never lost sight of or made the mistake of thinking that anyone but God was in control. He didn't think Nebuchadnezzar was in control. He didn't think Cyrus was in control. He didn't think Darius the Mede was in control. He didn't think the governors were in control. He kept in mind who really had the sovereign control of all the situations. Now, I... I, um, about eight months ago, I was caught up in a situation where I was trying to help a different couple groups of people, and it was not going well, and I was trying to be a good pastor in the midst of it, and got very complicated, very intense, and very heated, and in the middle of me trying to help these folks, a friend of mine said to me, you know, Kurt, this is a very complicated situation. It would be good if you went and saw a counselor and asked the counselor's help to handle how stressful this is, and I, I said to him, I don't think I need a counselor, and the second I said that, In my mind, another little voice said, no, you're totally wrong. You do need to go to counseling. And that little voice will call it God. (laughs) I felt a little convicted because I've I've, I've actually given this advice to lots of people. This would be good for you to go get some counseling for a while and get another perspective and get a mental health professional. So I call this guy named Jeff who's an incredible counselor in our community and I've sent a lot of people to him. I probably have paid for two of his kids to go to college. I mean, I've really... I really like this guy. He's great. So I went to him. I said to my wife, I'm going to go for about three months at least because I think I'm going to have to do some work in there before I get any epiphanies. And I sat down with him. He just started asking me questions. And I started talking to him about how I was feeling, what I was doing. And about 45 minutes into the session, he says to me, Kurt, can I just say one thing to you? And I I said, sure. He looked at me. He said, you're making this one mistake. You're trying to control the outcome. But when he said it, I, I was like God speaking to me. And just like a thousand pounds went off my shoulders. He said, Kurt, your job is to bring the best version of you to this circumstance and know that only God and God alone can affect the outcome. You're not in charge of the outcome. You're not in charge of the outcome for your parents. You're not in charge of the outcome for your teachers. You're not in charge of the outcome for the the, uh, state of the economy. You're not in charge of the outcome for the uh, um, racial reconciliation in our world. You bring your best version of yourself to those situations and three times a day you get on your knees and say, God, you are in control. If there's one thing I want you to get in this season and you gotta just hang on to it. If there's nothing else you learn from this sermon, remember, Remember this, it is God who's in control, not you. I want you to fire yourself from being the director and supervisor of results and step in to the job of just doing what you got with what you got where you're at. 
bring in the best version of yourself. What's the application here? Are you practicing a pattern of prayer? How did Daniel keep in mind that he wasn't in control? How did Daniel keep out of that spot where he put himself in the place of God? It's really easy to do. And you can have very good motives in wanting to really help people and put yourself in that place. And also, you know what causes you to put yourself in that place? Is when you start having some success. Daniel had great success, and yet he stayed out of that harmful emotional place where you're trying to manipulate control and cause the effect of, of the results. And the way he did it was he stayed in the presence of God, and he remembered the promises of God. His mind was directed directed towards God, not control. You can't control anything, my friend. But you can have a meeting with the person who does. Here's my little exhortation to you. Can I say this really simple? This is going to sound so simple, but it's very profound. Talk to Jesus every day. Just talk to him. Talk to him. When you feel afraid, I want you to say, Jesus, I feel afraid. When you feel anxious, I want you to say, Jesus, I don't even know why. I feel anxious. Last night I'm just laying on my bed going, Jesus, why can't I sleep? I'm very tired. I'm so tired I can't sleep. Jesus, help. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, I want to show you a picture. Um, we got a lot of young people in this service, so this would be very educational for you. I'm going to show you a picture. Anyone remember what this is? Okay, this whole section has no idea. They're not laughing at all. Okay, let me explain to all the teenagers in the room. This is a thing called MapQuest. And before our phones were smarter than us and to told us where to go, this is how you would find your way to places you'd never been before, is you would enter the destination in MapQuest on your desktop computer. That was a thing. And then you would hit print, and it would print out on the printer, and you would grab these. And I had so many of these in my car because I have no sense of direction. There's like four-inch pile at the bottom of the passenger seat of these. And then what would happen is that as you were driving, if you had a passenger, they would read you. They'd go left, 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 right now. Oh, you missed it. And God forbid that if it printed out two sheets and you only grabbed one and the last three directions, or this is the worst one, you're late for a job interview, but your printer no longer has magenta, so it won't print out. You can't just carry the printer into your car. Horrible. And the other thing about this map quest, it ruined marriages. It ruined marriages. Because every marriage is made out of one person who wants to jump in the car and just start driving. That's me. And, and every marriage has one person who wants to sit in the car for 15 minutes doing nothing, studying the map. That's my wife. Just memorizing every step where I'm going, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. Who's got Adderall? Let's go, let's go. In life and in driving, there's, it's a difference. Driving, this is a great strategy to study the map and to know every turn by turn. And if you can get all the turns printed out, it's a good thing to know them and compare them to the map. It never happens in life. You're never gonna get a sheet that's gonna tell you each and every one of those turns. The truth is, if God printed out a map quest of your life and told you each and every one of those turns, you would need adult diapers. You would just need, <laughs> it'd be too stressful. So often God doesn't map it all the way out. And this is one of the keys to Daniel and how he didn't get so discouraged and cynical. Daniel did the next right thing. He just did the next right thing. So he gets taken into captivity, doesn't get bitter, doesn't get discouraged. He just does the next right thing. Uh, king has a dream, just does the next right thing. He's got a new king he's got to serve. He does the next right thing. Then listen to what King Darius says about him twice. He says two different times, Daniel, the God who you serve continually, you know how to actually have an effective life? It's not to know every turn. It's to be a person committed to the idea of serving God continually. What, what, what would have happened if Darius would have showed up and said, God, Daniel, I hope you're rescued by the God you serve most of the time. I hope you're rescued by the God you serve three Sundays a month. No, Daniel made it through all these situations and came out of discouraging moments because he was that continually served guy. Look what it says about him. It says he was distinguished. He was exceptional. They couldn't find any corruption against him. They tried to do a negative report on him, a negative campaign against him, a, a opposition a research on him, and they said they found nothing. And then compare that to these vicious viceroys, these governors, these, these corrupt Machiavellian plotters. They went as a group, went as a group, went as a group. Over and over it says. 
They were involved. This is everything that Ray was talking about two weeks ago when he talked about you're not the boss of any culture. If you haven't heard that message, now is the time. You've got to go listen to that message. Because there's a difference between saying, God, you're my guide. God, you've got the results. And saying, ah, you know what? Everyone's going this way, so I'm going to go that way. They're involved in a thing sociologists called groupthink. What is groupthink? It's making crowd-based decisions that discourage creativity, individual gifting, things like this, or individual responsibility. Groupthink is so easy to get into, and it's hard to see when you're in it. Don't let anyone else but your creator define your direction. Uh, I got a little place in the notes there where I've, I've just kind of looked at Darius. We could study this whole chapter from Darius's point of view. It would be the anatomy of a bad decision. You can go ahead and look at that if you're an eager beaver or extra credit person. Here's the application. Who helps you make decisions? It's obviously who helped make Daniel's decision. He went before God three times. Why three times? I think it's some metaphor for how he draw, drew sustenance from God. Eats three times a day. He prays three times a day. He's making his decisions in a God-honoring, God-first, God's truth point of view. Now, he's still got his friends around him. He's not making them in a vacuum, but he's God-first. How are these manipulative, lying governors making their decision? They went as a group. They went as a group. They went as a group. And that brings us to our final point. Daniel expected God's intervention. Daniel said, you know what? Not only do I leave the results up to God, I expect God to give me the results. I know he's going to actually do something here. What God does and how he does it in the time differs from person to person and moment to moment. One of the reasons God so powerfully restores Daniel here is because he's restoring the nation of Israel because that's where Jesus has to come from. Jesus comes from the nation of Israel and Jesus actually is the person who does the ultimate intervention. He comes and he saves us. My friends, you and I can look at this story and see that actually Jesus is the greater Daniel. The only difference between Jesus and Daniel is that Daniel was taken out of royalty. Jesus was taken out of royalty. Daniel was placed in a foreign situation that was very difficult. Jesus was placed in this earth. Both of them were threatened by jealous rivals and both were threatened of their life. The only difference is when Daniel came out of that tomb, he had no marks on him. When Jesus came out of that tomb, There was a piercing in his right hand and his left. And there was a great wound in his side and wounds in both of his feet. Because the difference between Daniel and Jesus is this. God intervened for Daniel. Jesus is God and intervened for you and me. My friend, you can't control the outcome, but you know the person who can. I bet this week up, pastor named Pastor Troy from Las Vegas. I was introduced to him through Brent Newman. Brent's there on my right there. Um, Brent is CHP, longtime Bayside, incredible guy. He was actually ministering to some cops in Las Vegas area, and he got to meet Pastor Troy, and that's the undersheriff of all Las Vegas. They're there together. Pastor Troy is just He's one of my heroes now. This guy is doing so much in the community. He went to the police and he said, listen, I used to be a gang member and now I have this great relationship with gang members. I can help change their lives. Let's partner together. He's one of these pastors that has a great relationship with the community, a great relationship with gang members, and a great relationship with police officers. And he doesn't see that there should be any separation between those three. He... he, He actually is causing some particular areas because the ministry they're doing in Las Vegas to have the uh, violent death rate go down by 65%. I said, Pastor Troy, how are you doing that? He had this beautiful answer. He said, we're inviting God into the violence. We're inviting God into the alleyways. We're inviting God into the gangs. We're inviting God in to the schools. My friend, here's the thing. God wants you to take you out of your bad situation. You got a difficult thing with addiction. You got a difficult thing with your son, your daughter, your relationship, your business, your job, your direction. God wants to help you. He wants to intervene and take you out of that. Before he can take you out of it, you got to invite him into it. I said, tell me, what, how does that really work? He said, well, I'll give you, for instance, We had one middle school five years ago 
And this middle school, about every three weeks, something very violent, a violent shooting would happen. We just couldn't figure it out. Why was this such a troubled area? And then it came to a head where in a crossfire situation, an eight-year-old boy died, struck by a bullet and died. So Pastor Troy said, we're not gonna let this happen. He went to the police with an idea. He said, what if we went at lunchtime in this middle school and just served the kids hamburgers and hot dogs and got to know them? So cops and pastors would go into this middle school and they'd just be serving hamburgers and hot dogs and the kids started talking to them and opened up their lives and they said, here's what happens. We have fights among each other and then our older brothers and sisters who are in gangs hear about our fights and it gets to be a rivalry thing and it starts escalating and escalating until on a Friday afternoon, there's a big, huge brawl and then that's where the violence just escalates and escalates. And they said, where's the, this brawl gonna be at? And they said, well, this one's gonna happen this Friday at four o'clock. You think you could do anything about it, Pastor? And he said, let me make one call. And he got on his phone and he called his worship leader. He said, what are you doing this Friday at 3.30? He said, nothing. He said, how about we have some worship in church? He said, yeah, you want me to set up in the sanctuary? He said, no, I got an alleyway next to the middle school. And they brought all the worship team and they invited other worship teams from around Las Vegas and they piled into that and then they let the parents know, listen, your kids want to have violence and fight in this alley, but we're going to stand and we're going to worship. And non-Christian parents came out to this and started applauding. They gave an altar call. That first night, 10 parents accepted Christ. A group of kids showed up and they just, he said they were just standing there shocked, listening to the Lord, no one's fighting. And then about 10 of them broke off and they were going to go fight somewhere else. And a bunch of worship leaders got in a van and they followed them when they wanted to go fight they got out and started playing their guitars and their kids were like well, you're following us everywhere and they're like, all right because we're going to invite God in we're not going to deny the situation run from the situation look at the discouragement and say it's not there we're not sticking our heads in the sand we're inviting God into the situation Amen. that could happen here that's got to happen here Wave after wave of discouragement. The answer is three times a day. God, you got the results. You got the results. But we're going to do the next right thing and watch you move as we invite you into the discouragement to change it like only Jesus can. My friend, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ, into the center of your life, that's step one. You gotta invite Jesus into here before he can handle any of the things going on in your life. I'm gonna ask every single person to bow their head and close their eyes right now. I'm not gonna bring anyone forward or do anything like that, but I got this serious question. Have you totally and completely surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? If you haven't, right now I'm gonna ask you to pray a simple prayer. I'll pray out loud, you pray in your heart, right where you're sitting. Just say this directly to God. I invite you into the center of my life. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, God, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. I accept his forgiveness right now. Lord, I pray for my heart. Help me follow you every day and in every way. Just right now in this God moment, right now, no one looking around, if you pray that simple prayer, either as a recommitment or a first time commitment, either in the room or online, if you prayed that simple prayer, I wanna pray a prayer of blessing over you that you'd walk into that prayer. I'm not going to bring you forward. Like I said, I'm just going to pray over you. If you pray that prayer with me, would you do me a favor right now? Would you just raise your hand and say, yeah, Pastor Kerr, pray for me. Pray for me. Put it up high. Wow. Father, I thank you for every decision that was made, every hand that went up, either on-site or online. God, and I do pray that you would show them who you are just the way you showed Daniel, that you're the God of the outcome, that they don't have to worry about every discouraging news that comes. All they need to do is cultivate the relationship with you. Father, keep them close. 
Show them again and again how much you love them. And in the name of Jesus, let them follow you every day and in every way.